if you remember, we talked about uh, matrix times vector multiplication. So if you take some matrix times a vector x, y, z, you can compute it as like dot products of You do it as a dot product times, as a dot product of the rows with the column. So you would get like x plus z in the first entry, 2x plus 3y in the second entry, and negative y plus z in the third entry. And so sometimes they'll ask something like find a matrix A that multiplies a vector x, y, z to get some other vector like x minus 2y, 3x plus 4z, x plus y plus 2z, something like that. So you can look at the coefficients in front of the, the x, and the y, and the z. And those give you the entries of the matrix. So in this case, A would be the matrix 1, negative 2, 0. For that, uh, so I'm using those coefficients for the first row. And then these coefficients for the second row. So the second row would be 3, 0, 4. And 1, 1, 2 for the last one. So this matrix, you know, it takes x, y, z when you perform the multiplication you get exactly the vector. So that's a common kind of question that they ask. Another example would be if you just have a diagonal matrix with entries along the diagonal, zeros everywhere else. The effect that that matrix has when you multiply it by x, y, z is uh, it just multiplies the first entry by whatever that first diagonal entry is, and it multiplies the second entry by whatever that second diagonal entry is. So it'll take uh, this vector and it'll give you x, 2y, minus 3z. Does that make sense? The identity matrix, which we denote by I, it has ones on the diagonal and then zeros everywhere else. So this is like a, an arbitrary n by n matrix. For example, the 3 by 3 identity matrix is this one. And it's a diagonal matrix, so the effect it has is to multiply each entry of a vector by effectively 1. So it just doesn't change any vector when you multiply it by identity matrix. It's like multiplying a number by 1, essentially. So an elementary matrix is like the identity, but just with one entry changed. Right, I is the identity matrix is always a square matrix, always a square matrix. An elementary matrix is identity, but with one entry changed. For example, this matrix, we take the identity matrix, but then you change, like, maybe this entry, make it two. 
then that's an elementary matrix. Or this matrix. That's too many entries. Those are elementary matrices. So the important thing about elementary matrices is uh, they represent operations on systems of linear equations. So usually when we're trying to solve a system of equations, we'll do like equation 2 minus equation 1 or equation 3 minus 2 equation 1 or something like that. We'll do those kinds of operations and those can be represented uh, using these elementary matrices. So that's why they're important. So we can use them to reduce systems of equations. For example, you take this system of equations which you can write as a matrix equation like that. We would want to do the operation, we want to reduce this to a zero maybe. So we, maybe we want to do the row, the row operation, row three, row two minus three row one. Or equation two minus three equation one. Same thing. And then if we did that, we would get the we would get this equation. That would be a zero. This would be seven y minus six y is just y. And two minus three is negative one. But you can represent that as this elementary matrix times the original matrix we had, one, two, three, seven, multiplying it on both sides. So it's another way to represent that operation that we did. Is if you multiply this out, if you multiply this matrix, if you multiply these two matrices together, you get exactly this matrix. 1, 2, 0, 1. And on the right-hand side, you would get 1, negative 1. So you can see that the, the matrix we get is exactly the coefficient matrix of this system. An upper triangular matrix is a matrix whose entries are zero below the diagonal. Like this matrix. So it has this upper triangular form zeros below the diagonal. It's similarly a lower triangular matrix. It has zeros above the diagonal. So for example, this one would be lower triangular. because it has this lower triangle right there in the bottom left. So one thing about elementary matrices that's important is that they're easy to find the inverse of. So in order to find the inverse of an elementary matrix, let's say I, I did the row operation, I, I had some system of equations, and I did an operation like equation 2 minus 3 equation 1. 
like before. Then the, the elementary matrix that does that is this matrix, which you get by just taking the second row and subtracting three of the first row using the identity matrix. You take identity and, and, and do this row operation to that matrix and you get this elementary matrix. In order to find the inverse of this, you just take the one entry that's changed and then you change the sign. So the inverse of E would be this matrix. Because the inverse operation of equation 2 minus 3 equation 1 is just equation 2 plus 3 equation 1. Those are inverse operations. So these are inverse matrices. So they're easy to find the inverse of. So let's uh, do an example where I where we use those to solve some three by three system. I take this system of equations. Um, you can write it as a matrix equation. One, two, three. So we can start by reducing this entry to a zero. So we can do equation two minus two times equation one. So this corresponds to the, the elementary matrix E21. So you take the identity matrix and perform this operation on the rows of the matrix. So I'll take the second row and subtract two of the first row to get negative two here. So it corresponds to that matrix. And then when you perform this operation on the matrix here, you get uh, this. Five minus four gives you one. 3 minus 2 gives you 1. And then if you do it to both sides, you get 1, 0, 3. And then you can reduce this entry to a 0. Basically, I'm trying to turn the matrix into an upper triangular matrix. So you can do that by doing equation 3 minus 3 equation 2, which is represented by this matrix. So the way I'm labeling the matrix E21, for example, that's the row of the entry that's being changed in the matrix. So I was changing the 2, 1 entry, the second row, first column entry. So I, that's why this is 2, 1. Similarly, I'm changing the 3, 2 entry of this matrix. So I called it 3, 2. That's the notation. Anyways, after you do that operation, you get an upper triangular matrix. So this would be a 1, and then 3 minus 3 times 0 is just 3. And then from here, you can solve the system. If you write it out again, write out the new system reduced system, you get this. And so immediately you know what z is from the last equation. And you can take that and plug that into the second equation and get y equals negative 3. And you can take both of those things and use them in the first equation to get x equals 1 minus 2 times y, which is negative 3, minus z, which is 3. So you get a 2. I mean, plus six, seven, four. Okay. So that's the solution. X, Y, Z equals four, negative three, three. 
So in summary, what we did there is we had some system AX equals B, where X and B are vectors. X and B are vectors, and A is a matrix. And we took A and we multiplied both sides by these elementary matrices. We did E21 first on both sides. And then we multiplied on both sides by E32. And we ended up with some upper triangular system that turned into an upper triangular matrix U. And this was some other vector on the right hand side, call it Y. And we took that and we did a backward substitution. We started with Z and solved for Z and then Y then X. So we did backward substitution. So this leads to like the, the LU factorization. Uh, let's see, I did the row operation row 2 minus, yeah, I did equation 2 minus 2 equation 1 first. So this happened first, which means that one should come first. So that one happened on A first on both sides. And then after that, I put E32 there. Does that make sense? So I multiply both sides by E21, and then I multiply both sides by E32, basically. OK, so this leads to the LU factorization. So here, if you take E32 and E21 and you invert it, in which case you have to swap the order of the multiplication, you get the you get a lower triangular matrix L. So this means that A is equal to L times U because L is E21 inverse E32 inverse, and U is equal to E21 or E32 times E21. A. So since U is E32, E21, A, if you invert both sides, if you invert that to both sides, you get A equals LU. And so that's the LU factorization. And that's usually how they want you to format answers when they say to solve it using elimination. So the method to solve it using LU factorization has a couple steps. First you find the upper triangular matrix which is just a product of the elementary matrices that you use to reduce it, times A. So say these are the elementary matrices representing the row operations you're doing. You take those, you multiply them by A, and that gives you the upper triangular matrix U. And then the lower triangular matrix ends up being the inverse of that product of elementary matrices. And then you take that and you use those to solve AX equals B. So since A is LU, this system becomes LUX equals B. And you let UX equals Y so that your system becomes LY equals B. So you take that, put it there for UX. That gives you LY equals B. And then you solve 
ly equals b using forward substitution for y. Yeah, sorry. Step two was finding the lower triangular matrix as a product, as the inverse of the product of elementary matrices. So you solve Ly equals B in the third step for Y using forward substitution. And once you have Y, you can take that and solve for X. Since UX is Y, you can solve, let me say it this way. Since ux is y, you can solve ux equals y for x, because we have y now. So this is backward substitution. So that's the, the process for solving the system of equations using the LU factorization. You find L and U, and then you do the, the solving process in two steps, doing forward substitution with the lower triangular matrix and then backward substitution using the upper triangular matrix. So let's do an example of that process. So say your matrix is this, 1, 2, 2, 2, 5, 7, 1, 2, 3. And you have the right-hand side vector, which is 2, 0, 1. And then x is just the vector we're solving for, x1, x2, x3. So you want to reduce A to an upper triangular matrix first. So you first want to reduce that entry, maybe. It's not a big deal what order you do it in, but let's say we want to reduce this 2 to a 0. So we can do that doing row 2 minus 2 row 1, which is represented by the matrix E21, which is that elementary matrix. So then the product of E21 times A gives you this. Let's see, 2 minus 2 is 0, 5 minus 2 is 3, 7 minus, well, that should be 1. 7 minus 4 gives you 3. The third row is not changed. And then let me just leave it as E21A. The right hand side, not important right now. So then we want to reduce this 1 to a 0, maybe. So we can do row 3 minus row 1, which uh, uses the matrix. E31. So we multiply E31 on both sides. And we get this. So that's U. That's the matrix U. Which means to find A equals LU, you can just Move the uh, move these to the right hand side, so A is equal to E three one, E two one inverse times U. So this is your L. That's the lower triangular matrix. So we just need to take E two one, which is one zero zero negative two one zero 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 one and multiply it by, or really we need to multiply, we need to invert that matrix first. And we need to multiply it by the inverse of this matrix to get L. So the inverse of this guy just takes that negative 2 and makes it a positive 2, right? And then the inverse of this matrix, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, is just 
same thing, but with that negative one turned into a positive one. And so L is the product of those two matrices. So if you multiply these out, you get 2, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. And it's a lower triangular matrix. So it has that lower triangular form. So we know L and we know U. So the, the next step is to solve LY equals B. Solve LY equals B using forward substitution. So this, uh, this equation LY equals B says if you say y is y1, y2, y3, and remember our b is the vector 2, 0, 1. So if you write out ly equals b, if you write it out as a system of equations, you get y1 equals 2, 2y1 two plus y2 equals 0. And y1 plus y3 equals 1. So I'm just taking these coefficients here and putting them in the system of equations. The b is the right-hand side vector. So using forward sub substitution, y1 is 2. Putting that in the second equation, you get 2 times 2 plus y2 is 0. So y2 is negative 4. And then using that information in the third equation, y3 is 1 minus y1, which is 1 minus 2. That's negative 1. So the y vector is 2, negative 4, negative 1. That process makes sense, solving for the y. So we need to use that y and solve ux equals y next for x. So now we solve ux equals y for x, which is x1, x2, x3. So if we, let me write down what u is again. Our u from before was 1, 2, 2, 0, 1, 3, 0, 0, 1. I got that from here. That was the u. So you take that. And let's write out a system of equations. x1 plus 2x2 plus 2x3 is the first coordinate of y, which is 2. And then x2 plus 3x3 is the second coordinate of y, which is negative 4. And then x3 equals negative 1. So third equation says x3 is negative 1. We can take that, use that in the second equation. x2 is negative 4 minus 3 times negative 1, which is negative 1. And then we can use both of those in the first equation. x1 is 2 minus 2 times x2, which is negative 1, minus 2 times x3, which is negative 1. So what x1 is 2 plus 2 plus 2. x1 so is 6. So that's the solution to the original equation. 6, negative 1, negative 1.
Uh, a equals L U. Yeah. A equals A. Um, yeah. So A X equals B is L U X equals B. L, yeah, right. L is the product is the inverse of the product of elementary matrices. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's talk about temporary permanent breakdown. So, for example, let's say you have some system of equations. Something like that. So in order to reduce this, you would want to do row 2 minus 3 row 1. Right, but what if it wasn't this system, and what if this 2 was actually a 0 in the upper left? So you had like this system of equations. Then you can't do that process because you can't reduce this using a zero. So that operation doesn't work. Uh, so this is called a temporary breakdown. So since you have a zero there, that's called a temporary breakdown. Temporary breakdown of elimination. That's what Gilbert Strain calls it. The solution to that is just to swap rows. That's how you resolve that breakdown. So your system becomes 6, 4, 0, 1. And then the right-hand side also gets swapped to 2, 1. That's how, you, that's how you correct the temporary breakdown, and you can solve it like usual. So a temporary breakdown occurs when there's a 0 in, pivot, in the pivot position. Uh, yeah, different okay. different matrices. All right. Yeah, so this first matrix is an example of something that goes that goes right. You can do that perfectly fine without any breakdown. But in this example, uh, things go wrong because you have a zero in the pivot position. Then let's say I change that matrix again and I have something like this. So in this problem, if you did say you want to reduce this entry, you do row two minus two row one. And then what happens is this goes to zero. And this also goes to zero, so you get zeros here. And then the right-hand side also goes to zero. So the second equation is just zero equals zero. Because the two equations to start with were the same equation, essentially. So this is an example of a permanent breakdown. You had the same equation in both. So they're the same equation, so you get infinitely many solutions. And that is an example of a permanent breakdown. But that's not the only way the permanent breakdown can occur. Let's say I changed this matrix, or let's say I changed the, just the right-hand side. I changed the 6. See, I change that to a 7. So that the new equation is a 
that. So in this case, when you do row two minus two row one, the left-hand side is still the same, but the right-hand side, this entry here doesn't go to zero, goes to one now. which means you have zero, zero equals one in the, the second equation, which is not good. Basically, the, the two equations you started were, with were parallel lines. So these are parallel lines, which give you no solution. And that's also a permanent breakdown. there I had two possibilities. I had this, this system where both equations were exactly the same, and you had infinitely many solutions that gave you a permanent breakdown. And then in this problem, the two equations gave you parallel lines. So you had no solution, which is also a permanent breakdown. So I guess to summarize, temporary breakdown occurs when there's a zero in the pivot position. So that's either the top left entry, or if it's a larger system, it could be any entry you, you would have used to, to reduce it. So you can solve, you can you can switch rows to fix that problem. That's temporary breakdown and then permanent breakdown it means you get a row of zeros. A row of zeros after elimination. Which means it's either no solution or infinitely many solutions. Whatever way fixes fixes the the breakdown. Because usually when you're doing that, you're trying to reduce your matrix to like an upper triangular matrix. So you want to make sure all the zeros go on the bottom left. So there's some common questions that they like to ask, like they'll give you a system of equations where one of the coefficients is like a variable and they say what number can you put in that variable so that it has a permanent or a temporary breakdown or something. So for what real number A? Does elimination break down temporarily or permanently? Permanently. So let's say it's this system of equations. So in order for a temporary breakdown to occur, I need a zero in the pivot position. Since it's just a two by two system, that's pretty easy because the only pivot that I'm really going to use is this, is the A. So that just means that A has to be zero. So that's the only pivot. 
So a temporary breakdown occurs when A equals zero. And what about for a permanent breakdown? A equals two. Yes. Why does A equals two give you a permanent breakdown? Right, that's true. If you put, if you try to put A equals two here, two x plus three y equals negative three. 4x plus 6y equals 6. Well, the left-hand side is just 2 times. This equation is 2 times equation 1. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess if you did row 2 minus 2 row 1, um, this equation would reduce to like 0x plus 0y equals So you get 0 equals 12. So it would give you no solution. So that's a permanent breakdown. Another example. Let's do like a 3 by 3 kind of example. So let's say Q and T are the variables here that we're trying to trying to choose values for. So the question is which number Q causes a permanent breakdown? Meaning either infinitely many or no solution. And then Which t, once you pick the q, which t causes uh, infinitely many solutions as opposed to no solution? So let's say... Well, if, if we were going to reduce the system to upper triangular, we would need this entry to go to zero. So let's say uh, we, we were trying to do that and we did equation two minus equation one. Then the system we would get is x plus 4y minus 2z equals 1. The second equation would turn into 0x plus 3y minus, that would be minus 4z equals 6 minus 1 gives you 5. The third equation is still the same, 3y plus q, z equals d. So you can kind of see that if q is negative 4, then these bottom two equations will be pretty much the same. They'll be parallel at least, parallel planes at least. So permanent breakdown, you get a row of zeros at the bottom, q equals negative 4. And then depending on what, we've, we, what we choose for t, that could either be no solution or infinitely many solutions. Obviously, if we choose t equals 5, they'll be exactly the same equation. So infinite solutions would be t equals 5, meaning the bottom two equations are the same plane. Uh, it's supposed to be a q, sorry. Oh, q. Infinite solutions would be t equals 5. And then uh, 
no solution would be anything other than five, right? So geometrically, infinite solutions would be two planes intersecting in a line. So that line of intersection would give you infinite solutions. And then no solution would be like parallel planes. the horrible pictures. So if we chose q equals, so t equals 5 was contingent upon q equal negative 4. So those those are sort of together. If you have both of those and you have infinitely many solutions because if you use q equals negative 4 and t equals 5, then these bottom two equations are the same. And so you would have like a row of zeros at the bottom. So your only two equations that really mattered are these two. Right. And so presumably, those two planes are going to intersect at a line. That's going to be the infinite solution. Q equals zero temporary breakdown. Um, I would say if Q is zero, then that is, yeah, that is a zero in the pivot position. But the thing is, like, I guess you don't really need that entry to reduce the system at all. Like, if that entry was zero, I wouldn't have any problem reducing it to a low, to an upper triangular matrix. Does that make sense? So I, I guess you could consider it a, a temporary breakdown, a breakdown, yeah. But you wouldn't need to do a row swap or anything. If... Like uh, if this if this entry was a zero, if this entry was a zero, then you would need to do a row swap because I need to use that entry when I'm reducing this one. So I would need to swap the second and third rows in that case. Let's say I have this system of equations, A and B are numbers we're trying to choose. Let's say we want to choose values of A and B such that first let's say we want the system to have no solution. Let's choose A and B so that the system has no solution. So if you have no solution, that means these lines are going to have to be parallel. This is a 6, by the way. So if they're going to be parallel, Notice this 6 is 2 times the 3, so that means A has to be 2 times this entry, and B has to be 2 times that entry. So A has to be 2 times negative 2, and B has to be 2 times 4. So no solution only happens when A is negative 4 and B is 8. Oh, you're right, yes. So that if they're the same equation, then they're the same line. So we need B to not be 8. So no solution would be B is not 8, A is negative 4. Infinite solutions, like you just said, would be A equals negative 4 and B equals 8.
What about if I wanted to? What if I wanted it to have a unique solution? That means that the lines should just intersect. They shouldn't be parallel. So I should different than negative four. Yes. Yeah. Right. As long as a is not negative four, you'll have a unique solution. Because then the lines couldn't be parallel. Basically, because uh, they wouldn't have the same slope. 